a bit about history of neuroanxial anesthesia now all those who are not that interested can skip this but trust me the stories are pretty interesting and that's why i decided to put in a few minutes to this so see it all started in uh, in 1800s uh, with the discovery of cocaine as a local anesthetic you see there was uh, in 1884 there was this guy uh, his name was karl koller uh, in vietnam he was a surgical intern basically he was a surgeon in vietnam and at that time he was uh, assisting a lot of eye surgeries and uh, at that time eye surgeries were preferably done without any anesthesia which was a problem with a uh, problem with ga at that time was because it was being given with ether right so firstly there was no concept of uh, muscle relaxation so the patient did not cooperate very well then with ether there was the main concern was the post operative nausea vomiting and since there were no fine sutures available at the time the risk for uh, extrusion of contents globe contents was pretty high so at that time ga was not a very good option for eye surgeries and so they were doing it without any anesthesia so there was a need for a local anesthetic now karl had a friend in psychology his name uh, was sigmund true i think you might have heard his name this guy was experimenting with cocaine for its stimulating for its cerebral stimulating uh, effects and he gave a small pouch a small pudiya of cocaine to collar and uh, collar then kept it in his pocket right and some contents of that must have leaked and so uh, collar didn't know but his fingers were actually uh, covered with cocaine so when he absent mindedly linked his finger uh, he realized that his tongue that went numb and that was a eureka moment for him we understood that the cocaine was a uh, potential local anesthetic so he started experimenting with cocaine on animals and uh, after few experimentation he finally found the courage to inject the solution of cocaine onto his own cornea and that was another eureka moment for him because the cornea was perfectly anesthetized and even uh, needle pricks were not uh, felt and he felt no pain and he didn't have to blink and he understood that this could be used for eye surgeries now uh, this was in 1884 right after this he he well he was a junior he got other people to publish his work and uh, so uh, cocaine became pretty famous and all over the world people starting to uh, experiment on it in america a lot of people were experiment experimenting with this and uh, two surgeons william halsted and uh, richard hall they even performed uh, nerve blocks with cocaine uh, of face and arm and they published their work as well but at that time but at that time a lot of people were self experimenting and poor guys they didn't know the addictive potential of cocaine and these people got addicted later on they were not I, i'm not sure if they were able to further any work with the cocaine but another year later in 1885 1885 sorry leonard corning he was a neurologist okay and he had observed halsted and hall and uh, being a neurologist he wanted to see if cocaine could help as a uh, in the therapy of some neurological problems okay so he uh, first injected this cocaine onto uh, in the spinal cord of a dog right oh, sorry of a dog and he found that uh, the dog could not move his rear legs but only the rear legs rest of it wa- was working perfectly well so the paralysis that confined only to the rear legs uh, later on he injected this cocaine like he used his spinal anesthesia technique on a man who was addicted to masturbation and um, although uh, when he injected uh, cocaine in his spinal cord 
the sensory block came but it came late like in dog it was pretty rapid he found out that the dog couldn't move his rear legs and the effect was pretty ra- rapid but uh, with this man that he was experimenting with the sensory block came at only after 20 to 25 minutes it was not that rapid so it seems that the dog actually got the spinal and the man uh, got an epidural Corning later on even coined the term uh, spinal anesthesia okay he even made his own uh, i think needles as well he proposed spinal anesthesia as an alternative to ga for at least the lower limbs or genito urinary surgeries then this was all happening in 1800 right? in, in 1885 almost 14 years later in 1899 it was dr august bayer who actually uh, demonstrated a proper case of spinal anesthesia now what happened in between this time was uh, quinky his name was henrich quinky he was from germany he was like 14 years it took them to finally come to uh like start practicing spinal anesthesia as a potential uh, mode of anesthesia anesthesia in between a lot of experimentation was happening but it was still not used as a regular mode of anesthesia uh, in between this time henry quinky he also developed his own needle that we still know right uh, it has a bevel at the end and he described his technique where he proposed that the lumbar puncture should confine to third and fourth lumbar space because they are below l1 and that's where the spinal cord terminates and that would be less traumatic 29 on dr august bayer he used quinky's technique what happened was that dr bayer had an assistant dr hildbrand right these two people what they did was uh dr bayer actually first uh, experimented on some patients and when the results were not very satisfactory they were like some patients were anesthetized properly some were not and then he finally concluded that more research was required then later on uh, at some point when he was confident enough he allowed his assistant to perform a lumbar puncture on dr bayer uh, but what happened was that as hildbrand punctured the dura he took some time in attaching the syringe right if this is the needle he had to attach the syringe and he took some time and so a lot of csf escaped and i think after that the spinal whatever dr hilbert Hill, did uh, was not pretty successful now they were about to abandon the whole experiment for the day when hilbert said no i will uh, uh, volunteer as the second subject and so dr bayer then gave him an lp and it was a successful one uh, he uh, although csf escaped with dr hilbert as well but it was not that much and uh, uh, the effect of cocaine was demonstrated very well it was so good that even blows with a hammer to his knee or even a pull on his testicle produced no sensation at all so they were very happy they celebrated very well that night with wines and cigars but then what happens next day they both had a severe headache at that time they thought it's just hangover but that headache went on for a longer time dr bayer was confined to bed for almost 9 days dr hilbert was confined to bed i mean he might have needed more days to be confined to bed but i think he rested for a 4 to 5 days and since he was a junior he was an assistant he had to get back to work <laughs> dr bayer also got the luxury but at, it was then that dr bayer understood that this severe headache actually came from csf leak and that's how in the same on the same day both of them had a successful spinal anesthesia and discovered what pdph is by experimenting on themselves later on uh, another guy named theodor tapier Now remember this name Tapier. This will come up again. He later on published a series of patients who were given spinal anesthesia. One twenty-five uh, cases in total. He was from France. Okay, and he proposed that you should not inject your drug until the CSF is seen. 
Now you understand how it has all evolved. At this moment, when we are performing a lumbar puncture, this is what we do, right? We use the Quinky's needle, which has a hub, and only when we uh, feel that we have uh, lost two resistance and the CSF is seen, pre flow CSF appears. That is the indication when we are very sure that we are in the subarachnoid space and we are in the CSF, and our drug will enter the CSF and not in any other space, and our spinal would not go, uh, would, would not fail. So this is how the whole technique evolved. Initially, they were only using the tactile uh, sensation of their own hands and the needle. Uh, and that's why they had failures. Now, Tafir, when he uh, said that, no, look at the CSF, that's the sure sign that we are in the right space and then go. On in 1900s, uh, Henrik Braun, He even described the use of epinephrine. He actually found that epinephrine could increase the duration of action for local anesthetics. And uh, he then developed uh, many nerve blocks as well. And he also uh, coined the term conduction anesthesia. Because essentially with local anesthesia, we are blocking the conduction. So see... Before this time, there was only general anesthesia. So anesthesia meant you make the patient unconscious. There was no talk about blocking the conduction of the nerve transmission. So this was the first time when they understood that local anesthesia, like locally acting drugs could be used to block the uh, conduction of uh, sensation. And that could work as an anesthesia mode for surgeries and other things. And thus he is also called as the father of conduction anesthesia. Also in 1900s, the concept of baricity uh, came into picture and uh, this was investigated much by Arthur Barker from London. He was a surgeon in London. Then in 1935, Lincoln Sissi, I think I am pronouncing it right, Sissi. Uh, he acknowledged uh, the, the work of uh, Arthur Barker for baricity and he used, in, he introduced hyperbaric tetracaine at that time and it was popularly known as pontocaine. Then in 1946, this was further exploited and John Adrian, Adriani, sorry, John Adriani, he uh, performed a saddle block or also known as perineal anesthesia. Like he understood that we can uh, localize, we can, uh, you know, concentrate the drug in one specific region. And if you keep the patient in sitting position after spinal, after injecting the drug, the drug will sink to the very bottom of the vertebral column and will anesthetize only the sacral nerves. And so only the perineum can be anesthetized isolatedly. And it was also found that saddle block was hemodynamically very stable and it was less um, dangerous than the uh, original or the conventional spinal technique. Uh, in 1940, another guy called William Len, Lemon. Now what happened was that by this time they uh, felt one drawback of spinal anesthesia and which was only single shot, only single injection. So you give it once and then you cannot control once the effect is at its peak you cannot control the duration of action right you cannot prolong the surgery with general anesthesia you keep on giving ether the uh, surgery if the surgery gets prolonged you can prolong the duration of anesthesia as well but with spinal it was difficult because it was only single injection so he devised a way to provide continuous spinal anesthesia and what he did was he first made a special needle, later on known as a lemon's needle, which was pretty malleable. Malleable means it could bend. And why? And it was made of silver. So what they did was, they um, they made special beds with the mattress on it, which had holes in the bottom. Okay. So the patient was given anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, in the lateral position. Okay. So here they give... Uh, the spinal anesthesia and later on this patient was made supine so when the patient was made supine the needle was left there itself because it has now found the space and they don't want to change it and when they made the patient supine this malleable uh, needle did not break 
and held its position, held its shape. And from the holes underneath the table and the mattress, they could give further, they could either maintain, like give further injection from the needle itself or they could change the needle or, uh, you know, reinsert it through these holes. So this way, more or like further shots of spinal anesthesia, spinal anesthetic agent could be given. And if there was a need to prolong the duration of anesthesia, that could be done. In 1942, later on, Waldo Edwards and uh, Robert Hinkson, these two people used his needle, the lemon's needle, and they used it for continuous um, caudal anal anesthesia. Analgesia was not yet understood. They used it for caudal anesthesia and they used it in obstetric patients undergoing surgery. Then in 1944, finally came our dear Edward Toey. And this guy developed the Toey needle that we all use now for epidural, which has a curved end. And the reason for this curved end was that he passed a silk catheter, which was actually a urinary catheter. He passed this catheter into the spinal space and gave incremental doses and thus only one puncture allowed a continuous technique for spinal anesthesia. Now the problem with these silk uh, catheters was that they were difficult to silk and later on I think uh, gum elastic catheters also came into picture. With problem with these was that they were difficult to sterilize and with repeated sterilization they broke uh, finally infection used to uh, seed in them a lot of cases of dural infection also uh, came into picture later on uh, these were replaced with the plastic then in 1949 there was this guy named martinez carbello he was from cuba he used Toy's needle and he performed the first epidural, continuous epidural anesthesia. Um, there was a neurologist, his name was Jean Anthnax, Anthnax Sicard. He used the caudal anesthesia technique for relief of back pain for his patients. Yeah, so this was like in uh, he introduced basically that we can use these techniques for analgesia as well. Uh, regarding the technique of finding the epidural uh, epidural space, the LOR technique that we use, it was also known as the Pages Dogloity. Dogloity? Dogloity? Yes, Dogloity. Sorry. Okay, these pronunciations are difficult for me. I just excuse me for them. Uh, pages uh, Dogliotti single injection technique for epidural. Okay, uh, now these two are two different people. Pages actually worked in 1921. He uh, his full name was Captain Fidel Pages, and he demonstrated segmental single in injections. Like he gave epidural anesthesia, but he gave them segmentally but unfortunately he died pretty soon but his work got published after about a decade dog loyalty uh, he uh, then described pro proper classic cases for epidural uh, anesthesia and dog loyalty use lor technique pages although uh, pages although use uh, the tactile uh, palpation only to identify epidural space. Dog Lighty used the LOR technique. So, uh, the work of both of these are recognized very well in describing how to give uh, epidural anesthesia, and I think it's still followed. And because both of them worked independently, but very major contributions from their work is considered. So, th the technique is named after both of them. So, this is mostly about. Um, uh, the history of neuraxial analysis. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm not sure if anybody will ask this in the exams or not, uh, but uh, it was interesting to read. So I thought I'll just uh, explain this as well.